All right, welcome everyone. Our next speaker will be Krishna Gade, founder and CEO of Fiddler Labs, an enterprise startup building an explainable AI engine to address problems regarding bias, fairness, and transparency in AI. An entrepreneur, an engineering leader with a strong technical experience of creating scalable platforms and delightful consumer products, Krishna previously held senior engineering leadership roles at Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Microsoft. Please welcome Krishna. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Cool. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, explainability, why you need it, and uh, how you can actually build it into your ML workflow. Uh, and my agenda is like to cover some of the motivation, why we started the company, and why explainability is important, how, how to build explainability, and kind of some of the challenges, because it's still an evolving topic, and how can we operationalize these concepts. So motivation, uh, so obviously this is, your, this is preaching to the choir, machine learning is everywhere, this adoption of AI is growing across industries, this is like the latest numbers from Wall Street Journal. Um, the problem that uh, we are trying to solve is uh, machine learning and AI are increasingly becoming a black box, right? People are trying to build really complex models for various different sectors, especially uh, also in sectors where uh, there, uh, there's a human review required and, and regulations um, happen. So when you have black box models, like when I say black box model, I would say any sufficiently complex model, it could be like a random forest, a gradient booster tree, a neural network, that could be uh, serving an end user decisions. Um, and, and you have these questions inside your organization. So end users may be asking, why am I seeing this, uh, uh, this news story in the case of a Facebook, or why am I getting this, why, why is my loan getting rejected, or why is my health diagnosis, so on and so forth. And then when you have uh, such a situation, especially when, when the model is making poor decisions, uh, you have this kind of questions internally. Uh, maybe like data scientists want to know how can they improve the model. Uh, engineering teams want to want make sure how can they monitor and debug the models. And, and if you have customer support that is responsible for answering questions for customers, they want to know how can they answer their customers better. And if you're in a regulated industry, you, you want to make sure that your systems are bi uh, unbiased and fair. So let's take this as an example. So let's say um, a bank wants to use a complex lending model. Um, uh, and, and, and these days, they, they want to use a lot of alternative data sources to, uh, and also build uh, really complex models for like increasing accuracy and, and sort of uh, and, and for whatever business metric, right? So in, in that case, like a customer walks in and asks for a credit lending re request, and bank wants to use a complex lending model, and out comes a score, and the lending officer needs to deny the loan, and neither the lending officer nor the customer have no idea why their loan request was, was denied. And, and similarly, uh, black box AI has implications with regulations. Um, there are lots of uh, regulations around uh, all sort of uh, systems being able to answer uh, customer questions around uh, why is my uh, why why was like uh, an automated decision given given to me like this? Uh, this most popular one is Article 22 of GDPR, and then there is similar laws are entering the United States. There's California Consumer Privacy Act. There are three other states: uh, Washington, Illinois, and Massachusetts have entered uh, have sort of introduced bills in their state legislatures around um, around and transparency around machine learning. The other problem with black box AI is if unknowingly used, if you're not knowing what you're doing, you could actually amplify bias, right? So if you're trying to build models, like people are trying to build face recognition systems for screening candidates and, and whatnot, whatnot. So let's say you're, try, you're trying to build some, something like that to classify who's gonna be a nurse, then you'll have a lot more positive examples for, for a certain gender or, uh, or another gender and it could be biased. So in summary, uh, black box AI causes a lot of risks for organizations, whether that's losing customer trust by showing things that they don't expect or being non-compliant to regulations, having this whole problem of managing these models internally, being responsible for understanding and, uh, and sort of maintaining them, and then potentially hurting your company brand. So what's the solution? So the solution, uh, people are now sort of gravitating towards this, this concept of explainable AI. So how is it different from black box AI, right? So, so black box AI at a very high level, think about this, you're, you're feeding your data into a black box AI system, some sort of a machine learning process that takes the data, tries to build a model, and then it, you basically install the model into your product and it's serving decisions to your customers. And with explainable AI, is, it's kind of a new way of doing things. It's, uh, it's essentially you, you sort of can build explainable AI products where you're not, provide, not just providing the decisions, but also providing explanations. And you can collect feedback, which, is can, which can be internal or external users, and try to sort of improve the model decisions. And, and you're, as a result, your sort of decisions are clear and transparent. 
So it's all good. So how do you build this kind of explainability into your AI workflow, right? So there are basically two approaches. The first approach is you have an existing model and you want to understand how it works. So you want to provide post hoc explanations of the model. And the other one is to build an interpretable model. I mean, if you think about it, over the years, like machine learning was, was really logistic regression for a long time. And, and so you could understand the model, how it is working for a, to a large extent. And, and decision trees and, and recently GAMS, and they're all interpretable models. So you can give you a, a sort of understandability. But there's also an interest in building complex models because you want to get more accuracy and introduce large, large, large amounts of data and take advantage of the new algorithms. So that's why the approach one becomes more attractive. So this is kind of a very interesting cheat sheet of how you think about explainability, right? So, uh, so, so think about like you, you start with, you fit a model, and now let's say you can actually, uh, uh, let's say you can create a simpler model, then you maybe you should choose an interpretive model, maybe a linear model or a GAM or, 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 or a decision tree, right? And if that works, then you should do it. If not, let's say you have to build a black box model, then you have to sort of think about, am I explaining uh, one prediction at a time? And then the whole bunch of methods that are being proposed, there's LIME, there's SHAP, and I'm gonna cover some of these things and from the underlying principles. And then there's, you want to actually uh, in, sort of cover like no more than one prediction. You want to explain clusters of things, clusters of data points, then, you have, then there are other methods that, that you can sort of use. So this is kind of like a, a simple cheat sheet to remember um, how you can introduce explainability. So let's talk about explaining a pre-trained ML model, because that's more interesting. People want, people want to try, people want to build complex models, mostly like neural networks, random forests, like, and they want to explain how they work. And so typically, what, what are you trying to sort of answer? You have, you're providing this black box model an input. It could be some tabular data, maybe an image, maybe a sentence, and the model is, is predicting the next word or, or some sort of a label for the data. And so you want to now f f figure out why it is doing what it is doing. So let's look at this. So this is an image, and the model is classifying this image to be a firewood. Now the immediate question is, why is this classifying it as fireboard? What is causing the model to think that this is a fireboard? And this, this boy is being classified by the model as a shoe, as a clock shoe, right? Now why did the network label the message as clock shoe? So this, you can actually formulate this problem as an attribution problem. You can kind of like uh, sort of think about like, okay, I'm basically, so think about the system as a black box system. You're feeding the input. It could be, it could be like a tabular data set of features or it could be an image with, which, is, which is represented as sort of pixels. And you want to identify, you want to attribute uh, the score of the model to a certain segment, certain portion of the data, certain certain set of features, or certain set of pixels, or certain set of words that have contributed the most, right? It's a reductive formulation, but it's pretty effective, actually. And it has its roots in game theory, which I'm gonna cover a little bit. So what are some of the attribution methods? There's simple ablation-based methods, there's gradient-based methods, there's Shapley value-based methods, and, and so, so what's an ablation-based method, right? So ablation-based method is you basically turn off some pixels in the image. You want to, you want to basically like, uh, like let's remove certain features and see the loss in, in, in the prediction or the gain in the prediction and attribute the change of the, of the prediction to the feature. Now the problem is that it creates these unrealistic inputs. I mean, it creates things that are sort of not, not cannot happen. It doesn't take into, like interactive features. For example, let's say like 10 features come together to produce a model, you remove two features. Now, like you maybe see a loss in prediction, but those two features alone may be not contributing to it because they may be actually more effective in conjunction with all some other features. So there's network effects that you don't take care of. The other method is kind of taking, thinking about like the feature gradient approach. You basically attribute the feature to be like the feature times, feature value times the gradient at that point. Now, it, it works to some extent, but for example, in this case, uh, when you try to do the gradient-based method in this image, it basically sort of, it, it sort of like, it shows you a lot of noise and, and, and sort of like these are the points that are actually contributing to it. The main reason is the gradient-based methods, there is, if you kind of think about like this particular image and you kind of think about the intensity axis, so whereas like you scale the brightness along this axis. So there is a point where the gradients become interesting. And after a point, the gradients are not very interesting or informative in actually making the picture understandable. So what you want to really capture is the gradients here, right? So you want to basically, so for example, if you notice during this, during this period when you actually have at some level of brightness, the, the gradients are actually informing you 
these are the these white lines these white dots are the ones that are the water spouts and that are basically indicative of the image to be a fireboat but they don't sort of like they kind of dissipate into the noise when you actually completely uh, turn on the brightness now what you want is not just gradients at this level but you want to basically look at gradients at all levels and in some way integrate the gradients in some ways, you can basically take the average. So that's basically what the, the, this algorithm called integrated gradients does. It basically takes the average of all the gradients uh, uh, through, 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 through that path. And now you can actually see, for that image to be classified as a fireboat, uh, you would see that these are the spouts that are essentially responsible for, for, for the image to be classifying the fly, classified as a fireboat. So now, in this case, what is the baseline, right? So for everything we're trying to do, because you're trying to construct sort of a counterfactual, like a baseline that you want to compare your changes to the, to the features. And so like, so you need a baseline to explain these things. So in the case of an image model, so you can think about the baseline to be this black image, this ultimate black image. In the case of a text model, so it could be like a zero embedding word vector. Uh, in the case of like tabular models, you can kind of construct things, uh, sort of baselines around different norms. So for example, let's say why was this particular person rejected alone? Now compared to what? Compared to the people with similar salaries, compared to people in the same zip code, compared to, compared to the entire population. So you can kind of select these different norms as you explain things. So now let's use that, those concepts to see like why was this image labeled as a clock? The reason is this, right? So it kind of looks like a clog. So if you kind of th think about it, so it just looks like a shoe. So And so the model is actually thinking that this is actually a shoe. So this is another interesting use case with respect to explainability because um, like, let's say uh, this, this is actually a real study. So this, this, there were a bunch of x-rays that, uh, that were fed to a model that, uh, with sort of positive and negative examples of what's a cancer-causing x-ray and what's not a non-cancerous x-ray. And the model learned over time uh, and sort of what's a cancer brain, so very, very high, high, high AUC score. Now, without explainability, you can look at this x-ray. Okay, it has a very high, ac uh, high accuracy. With high accuracy, you can say this is, this is cancerous. But with, with explaining, we can actually look at it and say this is, this is the region of the image that is actually responsible for, for the image to be con for the model to consider the image as cancerous. Now, when we took this image to the radiologists, they like the doctors, they basically said they, these are all like the radiologists marking, right? So, so this is another way to kind of think about explainability is not just helping you understand why the model is predicting the way it is, but also helping you uncover some of the problems with your training data. So and what happened is here, uh, all the positive examples had the radiologist marking. So essentially a radiologist was marking like this is cancer, this is not cancer. And so the model picked up as a, an artifact of things that are not present in the image and learned on it. And this is kind of perfect like correlation versus causation here playing up. So highly correlated, not, not at all causal and creates like a very good model which is completely useless. So, 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 so now moving into like, so now like you can kind of apply these gradient methods to differentiable models like neural networks for example. Now what about tree-based models, forest-based models? Uh, so that's where kind of like uh, game theory comes to help us. So, so Shapley value is this classic result that came in the 50s by this person called Lloyd Shapley when he was understanding sort of these cooperative games. So let's say 10 people came together and started a company and the company started to make some revenue. Now you want to attribute the revenue in terms of bonuses to those 10 people. How do you do it, right? So Shapley value kind of comes up with a, a mechanism that's a very fair and appropriate distribution of, the, of this thing. So one simple method, as I mentioned, was like if this, well, let's say if you removed one employee, what would be the loss of revenue and attribute to it? But as I said in the previous examples, it has this lack of interaction features, lack of network effects. Now what Shapley value basically proposes is basically taking some sort of a marginal impact. So you basically think about like, like take all possible combinations of like employees and, and see like what will be the revenue changes and you basically attribute uh, the marginal, marginal contribution of each employee on average. And so this actually works pretty well, surprisingly, for machine learning models. So in the case of machine learning models, you define the model as a correlation game and you actually say like employees become the features and then this revenue becomes a model score. Now you can actually attribute uh, in, a, in a fair and appropriate way what each of these features can contribute to. So that would be sort of the Shapley value of the feature actually becomes the contributor. And actually, the Shapley values hold some nice axioms. For example, let's say there was a dummy feature. It was not contributing to it. It would get a zero value. And if there are two symmetric features, 
and two ex two identical employees with two different contributions, they, they, two similar contributions, they'll get the similar Shapley, say exact same Shapley values. So it has these nice pro nice properties that you would want to see that you can actually use in practice, and and it works well with uh, sort of machine learning models as well. So now if you apply that to your sort of credit request example, uh, let's say if you're using a, uh, a random forest model to to sort of produce a score for uh, for a loan application. Uh, you can then sort of visualize and and and, and sort of like show these um, uh, Shapley values in a, in a dashboard like this. So in this case, this person got a credit approval score. Uh, these are the features that went into the model. This is the impact of each of the feature, uh, and uh, this is the value of the feature, and and so this is the sort of impact of the features that are negative. Obviously, this is a hypothetical example. No bank uses like protected variables like marital status and gender in their in their in their model, but it gets it kind of shows you an illustrative way. So say like, for example, let's say if this person was a female and single and hence the model was actually being biased, you can kind of look at it and, and, and look at based on looking, looking at the Shapley values, understand what's going on and, and, and audit, audit the model. So, so this is kind of a uh, brief detour on explainability. What are some of the challenges, right? So let's start with why we arrived at this whole point of explainability. I mean, so just kind of like when you're, as you're trying to build machine learning, you're looking at the historical data and you're trying to build some classifiers. Let's say in the case of a fraud, fraud let's say you're trying to build a fraud model, you look at the historical fraud, build a fraud classifier that can actually be applied to newer transactions. So all good, but we also want the best model performance, hence we want to iterate on like really complex algorithms that can produce these like high AUC, high precision recall scores. However, increasingly people also want uh, interpretability of un uh, understandability of the models, right? And that's where the problem exists. So if you had a simple classifier, there was a very, like a linear classifier, let's say you had two features, distance from the home, and the transaction that was, that was done, uh, you can say, okay, based on looking at the data, you fit a linear model, you can actually explain it. Uh, so you can also explain a decision tree as well. So you can say, okay, if the distance from the home is greater than 100 miles and the transaction amount is greater than $1,000, then you can say this, this, this person is, 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 is this, this transaction is a fraudulent transaction. It's very simple to explain. People can understand it. Increasingly, real-world data is not like that. You have lots and lots of features, uh, tens of thousands of features, um, millions of examples, and, and, and you want to fit nonlinear models for those things. And that's when global interpretability becomes challenging. You want to understand a nonlinear model, like how do you sort of explain it to sort of a human, right? So, so, so this is where sort of local interpretability algorithms, like the whole research around local interpretability algorithms started with this paper called Lime that came in 2016, which is, is around basically the whole idea was to sort of like, can we explain a single prediction? So by actually sort of uh, coming up with sort of data points around the predictions and fitting a linear model to explain this, uh, the single prediction. And then uh, the, and the paper was introduced in 2017, which is like SHAP, which is the implementation of the Shapley value algorithm from 50s, which basically is, is quite popular today. And it, it shows you these explanations, like which are essentially uh, normalized Shapley values um, uh, to sort of understand the model prediction. So, but the problem with explainability is how do you evaluate these attributions, right? So now when I said like that, uh, that particular person was denied those score and I showed those attributions, FICO was this much, mar marital status was this much, what is, like, how can you trust those things? Like, like, so this is one of the, one of the sort of research areas, so there's no real m sort of metric out there. You can say like, this is how you can actually evaluate. Even whatever metric you have, suppose, let's say you have a bunch of human raters, evaluate those attributions, there's always this confirmation bias. What is good to me may not be good to you. So there's, this is an evolving topic, uh, topic of research, how do you evaluate explainability? So, so like, what are some of the problems that still exist with respect to explainable AI? So first thing, why do we need explanations, right? We want to, we want explanations because we want to make sure that model what, what sort of will behave in a certain way when we deploy to productions. Like as humans, we don't want to deal with, uns like we, we're, not, we're not very comfortable with uncertainty. We want to make sure, like models should make less mistakes. We kind of like create a higher bar for models. We want, like than humans. And so we want to know all the things that model may, may do, like when it's deployed in, in, in whatever uncertainty you want to know upfront. You want to also you want to also sort of drive towards causality, right? So you want to basically understand why was the prediction point three? 
Now, I showed you that the FICO score was contributing 30%, marital status was contributing 8 to 20%. Now, the second question is, why is the FICO score contributing 30%? So you kind of go down that causal path of asking like the five whys, right? Like, why is the FICO score contributing? Why, what, was, what were the number of examples that it was trained with? So like, explanations today are at the very high level, like surface area level. So essentially, most model explainability algorithms will, will sort of like tell you, uh, this prediction was so-and-so because of these features, but then beyond that, they won't be able to sort of help you with that. Are these transferable, right? So for example, like now you have basically, when you, when you find a model, when you test the model, uh, like before you launch the product, uh, before you launch it to production, and you're comfortable with like the validation of the models and, and uh, the sort of explanations it generate, are they actually transferable when you actually deploy to the deploy to the world? And that, that's like, for example, like model drift is a is a real thing. So the like the the data that you train with the model. Uh, the, uh, the data that the model is receiving in production could be very different, and the feature drift could actually hurt model performance. And and and, and identifying and explain and, and and sort of uh, showing feature drift is also part of explainability, in my opinion. And then providing more information. So one of the main reasons why explainability is so popular or getting popular these days is it is providing more information to the business user. So a loan officer can now ask a question, why is this person's loan denied? Or a physician can ask, is this really a cancerous x-ray? Or a geologist can ask, is the model telling me to drill the oil well here? Like is actually, is there gonna be like, uh, why is the model predicting the, the, the oil well is gonna be there? So it's, it's providing more information to the business user so that they can actually make those decisions or sometimes override those decisions. Decisions. So in summary, it's like, I think like these are the properties that are desired for an explainability, like can, is it actually helping you build trust? Is it sort of driving towards causality? Are the explanations sort of transferable from like uh, train test setups to real world? Are they providing more information? So at Fiddler, we are building like this platform is still a work in progress. It's a general purpose explainable AI engine. Um, so it basically is, 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 so the way that we are building a platform is it can connect to various databases in the world, so you can bring your training data wherever it exists, and uh, it can build, bring your custom models to our platform, and then we sort of help, help uh, customers analyze, uh, understand how these models work, and, and provide these insights through our APIs and dashboards. So what can be possible with explainability, right? So this is what I worked on when I was at Facebook. This is essentially like explanations for newsfeed uh, for, 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 for all the Facebook users. So this started out as a project which is kind of a simple debugging tool for newsfeed, uh, meant for developers to understand how machine, machine learning was working for newsfeed, and eventually grew in scope uh, and, 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 and sort, of, uh, sort of culminated in the launch of this feature called Why Am I Seeing This? So what you're seeing here is like the top five reasons why you're seeing the post, which is more, more sort of naive, user-friendly. Uh, so that's another thing with explainability is like it is context dependent. So the de explanations that would help a developer are not the explanations that would help like an end user, or explanations that would help a regulator are not the explanations that would help a data scientist. So our vision to build explainability in the AI workflow is to bake it throughout the AI workflow. So essentially, make it like a model debugger during the training process, so you can understand what you're doing during the training process. Being able to evaluate using explainability, evaluate the models, like, like sort of inspect the models versus like, like male versus female, or, or, or different sort of uh, uh, other protected attributes. Being able to sort of have sort of model management. Oftentimes, the causal questions of why did this happen go back to some sort of simple systems related questions. Oh, a bad model was deployed, and hence, like we are basically seeing these predictions, and 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 providing those justifications through when you are actually predicting, and as the way I showed, and being able to sort of compare to different models when you sort of like oftentimes when you're doing A/B testing, the people just look at business metrics. We think that you should also look at the explainability of uh, reasons behind the explainability of the models. And then using 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 explainability to sort of monitoring and debugging, so to understand sort of root cause analytics. Why was this prediction so low? Understanding outliers in model performance. So that's basically it. So that's kind of how we are going about it. And happy to take questions here.